Hey guys, The Network Burger here. Hope you've been doing well. So in this video, we will be looking at all of the user-based VPNs that we can use as Microtik users, because honestly, we get spoiled when it comes to VPNs and Microtik. There's so many different options, and I've actually had an amazing time just testing out all of the different VPNs to an AWS instance that I've been running based off of my last video where I created a VPN server in the cloud. And I'm going to be sharing those results with you as well as just be discussing all of the different VPNs with you. So let's get into the video. Let's quickly talk about why we want to use a VPN before we go into any of the VPN options. And I think this is important because why do you want to use a VPN? To me personally, it generally boils down to one of three reasons. Firstly, data encryption, because we like to connect securely. So maybe you're in an internet cafe or just a restaurant and you're accessing the open Wi-Fi on your laptop. There's a good chance that somebody might be intercepting your data and seeing what's happening. So to ensure that none of your data gets compromised, you might use a VPN to connect so that if somebody malicious gets all of your data, all they'll see is tunnel traffic. They won't know what the heck is going on. Same for your ISP or any apps that you might use. It makes it a lot more difficult to figure out what you're doing, which is great for us. Second point is remote access. So we do live in an age where things have shifted around a lot and there's many people that still work from home. And VPNs have really facilitated this for us because it allows us a means of accessing corporate environments or workflows remotely. So we don't need to physically go into the office to do anything. We can access all services from our desk or from the bus or wherever we are, as long as we have an internet connection. So remote access has definitely made it a lot easier for us. And then lastly, you do be, get people that want to bypass firewall limitations because maybe you are being censored in your country and you maybe need to get to a specific resource. People tend to use VPNs for that, or maybe you do it for something a lot simpler, like you want to access specific streaming content, like on Netflix, where you want to see a show that's typically only hosted in the UK, but you can't get it because you're not in the UK. How do you watch that show? Well, you can connect to a VPN that is in the UK, and then you can access those shows that way. So these are the typical three reasons that I see people use VPNs for. There's definitely more reasons, but I think this is what it mainly boils down to. Now, I also just quickly want to talk about some of the different types of VPNs we will see in the field. And it really comes down to two different types of connections. You can see stuff that we call site to site, which is mainly where we will set up something like a branch and head office or branch to branch or branch to cloud or whatever type of connectivity so that you can actually get to a site. Now, why do we call it site to site? Well, we might have two firewalls or routers or devices that will be creating a VPN tunnel to route networks across. So that is what we mainly use site to site VPN for. And then we get what we call the client-based VPN, where you might install a client on your phone or computer or on a server or something, and then you could, and it doesn't have to be a client. There's some protocols that just natively run on these operating systems, but then you would, in essence, create a VPN tunnel back to some type of server for either also the same purpose as side-to-side -side VPN to access corporate data or services, or it could just be to get to the internet so that you can browse however you want and do whatever you want. So this is like the typical setups that we see when it comes to VPNs, but you can have a mix mash of the things. It's really such a strange thing, but I wanted to stress these two type of connection types because you can use either with Microtik. So I'm not gonna tell you, hey, with zero tier, you can use it for site to site or client VPN because it applies to all of them. That's so amazing. First one I wanted to talk about is actually zero tier because this is a massive, massive game changer when it comes to VPN connectivity because it does the whole kaboot. It does stuff like SD-WAN, it's extremely fast, it use, it's passwordless so you can actually connect just using a network ID onto the zero tier network. There's no public IPs required. It, it's really such a game changer. You're obviously still gonna have to be connected to the internet but zero tier is so smart that it uses some type of coordination server in order to figure out 
what is behind that, and then how to actually facilitate setting up a tunnel between these two endpoints so that they can almost have this peer to peer connectivity. And it's crazy. And it's so cool because it even works as if it's on layer two. So you can see a MAC address and do stuff like VLANs and bridging and whatnot over zero tier. So this is one of my favorite VPN tunneling protocols. But I do want to stress a point that it does require ARM or ARM64. So this is not available to stuff like cloud hosted routers. It's also not available to any of the older MicroTix. So you will need to get a newish MicroTix to use zero tier, but it's definitely one of the best VPN solutions that I have seen. It's really it competes to stuff like Tailscale. It actually works pretty much the same as Tailscale. The difference is that Zero Tier is its own custom protocol, whereas Tailscale uses WireGuard as its underlying protocol to facilitate everything. Performance wise, I'd like to say that Zero Tier, it's, since it's custom based, it's a little bit slower than WireGuard, but it's really not even noticeable. It's really on par. It's really a fast and amazing VPN solution. Unfortunately, I couldn't run tests against it because I can't run it on the CHR, which is what I was using in my AWS instance. So WireGuard is next, and this is definitely my second favorite VPN on MicroTik. Reason being, if I can't use zero tier, I'm going to use WireGuard. Why? Because it is super fast. It operates at the kernel level of Linux. It is super secure. It's very modern, and it also uses key exchange. So you will exchange public keys with a peer in order to form that connectivity. It's also relatively easy to set up. So managing a tunnel, it's as easy as just configuring a new tunnel, setting what the allowed addresses is to go over the tunnel and off you go. And it, it works. It's really an amazing protocol. One thing I want to stress with it though, is it is preferable that you at least have one public IP. It doesn't need to be static, but if it is static, that's all the better. Reason being, if you are forming a peer relationship over a dynamic IP and the IP address changes for whatever reason, that IP will kind of linger on the WireGuard peer side and you'll manually have to disable and re-enable the peer to get things working again. You can fix that with some smart scripting on MicroTik's behalf as well, but just something to take note of. Other thing is, it's also only available on RouterOS version 7. So you, if you're running version 6 still, you're not going to be able to use WireGuard, but it's definitely my preferred VPN if I can't use zero tier. Now, OpenVPN. This has been a staple VPN for many people for many years, and I can understand why, because it's also relatively easy to set up once you understand it. But if you're new to the game and understanding how SSL certificates work and how to import and export them in the MicroTik, it's going to take a little bit of research, but it's definitely a good VPN choice still. So it, it works just fine you use ssl certificates and you can connect over tcp or udp um, on your microtech you also will set up a triple p profile with a username and password for authentication and stuff like ip addressing and routing and such and it's also advisable just to have a public ip that the server will have that people can connect against now again it can be a dynamic ip totally fine but the performance i want to stress was quite underwhelming for me. So I did test on UDP and TCP and UDP came out a lot faster, but it's definitely not one of the fastest VPN tunneling protocols that I've come across. So it's not lightweight and you'll definitely see quite a bit in your, your speed if you use OpenVPN. Now, one of the oldest VPNs around in my opinion, um, IPsec, and this thing has been around forever, but it is still very useful. And you do have this as Ike v1 or Ike v2. And IPsec is one of those things that never will go away because everything supports it. And when I mean everything, I mean almost, almost everything. So it's very useful in that sense that if you maybe have a third party provider that you need to connect with and don't, they don't support stuff like WireGuard or whatnot, then you'll typically use IPsec to form that connectivity because it is still super secure, especially Ike v2. And the performance is actually really good as well. Now, it, it actually works better for me than OpenVPN. I've tested that as well. And the speeds that you get is typically better. But again, you should also at least have one static IP that somebody's going to be initiating that connectivity from. And then once that connectivity gets formed, then it can also just figure out what its peers details are in the reverse packet, so to speak. Now, one drawback with IPsec on MicroTik is whenever you configure it, 
there is no virtual tunnel interface or a VTI, what people like to call them, created. So once you add the tunnel, it's all done on the firewall. It's all done on the IP, IP6 settings. So even your routing you're going to be doing on your firewall side, your encryption, everything. So you, you won't really be able to see what you route over the tunnel in your routing table. You'll actually have to go into the firewall to figure stuff out like that. So that is kind of a drawback on Microtik. So I actually wish that they do add something like a virtual tunnel interface. Who knows, maybe they will, but I'm doubtful because it's been this way since forever. SSTP. Now this is a VPN protocol that I had a lot of hope for because it is extremely useful in that it uses TCP to connect on port 443. Crazy, right? So it's the same port that is used for browsing. Now that means that it's going to be useful to punch through stuff like firewalls because most firewalls will obviously allow port 443 or HTTPS traffic. It also uses a server client based authentication and it's pretty cool that you can set up an SSL certificate for your authentication just to make things a little bit more secure. It is also going to do stuff like a username and password so you will configure a triple B profile with it and it's also recommended to have a public IP at the very minimum for the server for people to connect to. Performance wise, I was actually not impressed at all because in my instance on the multiple tests that I ran, my latency went up at least double. So to my AWS instance where all of the other VPNs would hover between 250 to 60 MS, my SSTP tunnel would be like 510 milliseconds. So that was quite crazy for me to see. And not only did the latency jump up, but my performance or throughput also went down the drain. It, it went down at least from 250 megabits down to 30 megabits down on a bandwidth test. So definitely something I can caution is, and I don't know if that's latency based or so the further away you are, the more sensitive your SSTP tunnel is, but I can definitely caution you that the throughput and latency will suffer quite a bit. So if you're looking for a way to bypass firewalls, it's great, but not so much for your performance. L2TP. Now, this is a protocol that I love in the ISP space because this is something that you might use for remote sites that's connecting over LTEs or DSL connections just to bring them into a VRF or MPLS environment. And I really love working with them. Now, it is also a server client based type of setup and it does connect using UDP, but there's something with L2TP that I want to just get out of the way and it's in the red text as well. L2TP by default doesn't encrypt anything. So when you create an L2TP tunnel, if anybody gets a hold of what's happening with it, they'll be able to see all of the data and packets as well. So if you want to actually secure your L2TP tunnel, you'll have to also use IPsec with it. Now, why is that an issue? Well, you're now double encrypting or encapsulating your packets, so it is going to cause a bit of a performance downgrade. But if you're just plainly using LTP, its speed is actually very fast. It's actually as comparable to something like WireGuard. I was getting the same speeds on just a plain LTP connection as WireGuard, so I was highly impressed with it. But that means that I'm not using the IPsec with it, so it, it's kind of a double-edged sword because I don't have the security. Configuring it is relatively the same as any other triple P connection on Microtik. You'll create a triple P profile, you'll enable LTTP server, and I also recommend at least having a public IP to connect you with it. Now, PPTP, this is probably the grandfather VPN protocol that even Microtik, when you try and configure this, will give you red text saying this is an old protocol, use something modern. <laughs> so that's quite funny to me. Now, PPTP, you will still see some people use it. Reason being, there might be some devices that only has PPTP support, but I'm talking about all devices now, or they're just used to setting it up. Now, I definitely recommend using something modern. I'll follow Microtik's suggestion with that as well, but I still want to just give you some of the info. Now, it does use TCP. It's also a server client based connection. It's the same setup with Triple P. Um, you'll set up a triple P profile with username and password, and you can set up stuff like tunnel IPs. And it's also recommended just to use a public reachable address as a server for people to form their connections to. Now, performance wise, I will definitely say that the latency and the actual bandwidth throughput wasn't that great. The latency was fine. The latency was on par with any other of the VPN technologies, but the throughput, it was still around 30, 40, megabits per second to 
America from South Africa. So for me, not the best performance, but it's still something that some people might tend to use. Now, I also want to bring out something else here and many more VPNs. So we get stuff that we can even use in the carrier space. Now, I'm not going to go into any of these VPNs specifically in this video. I'll make a separate video on the topic, but I just wanted to show you that there's even more. Now, Microtech really does spoil us. If you think about another vendor, they might give you two or three other VPN options max. Microtech, we've got so much, you might even get lost in it. So let's quickly just wrap things up with the video. So final impression, I love zero tier, man. It's it's so awesome to see how this protocol functions and how well it emulates a layer two network. I mean, you can even run stuff like an IPv6 network on top of it. <laughs> Crazy, right? So zero tier really ticks all of the right boxes for me, especially for a big scale network and SD-WAN. But if zero tier again isn't available, I'll definitely go for WireGuard just because of how easy it is to configure, how secure it is and how fast it is. So. Feel free to let me know what VPN tunnels you use, what your performance looks like, and what you thought about this video. And also feel free to leave any comments about anything else you'd like to see me maybe bring up or make a video about. I'd like to also just thank all of my Patreon and YouTube members, and I'll catch you guys in the next video. See ya.